on there. And Tracy um, and her had been talking for a long time and we've been sponsoring uh, some of the work down there since, and I looked it up uh, earlier today since 2012. And so they're doing some really amazing things. Uh, we asked that if Tanya would come and talk to us and tell us a little bit more about the work. Um, one story that I just want to share before we went is that um, with some of the kids that we've, we've helped uh, sponsor, it's been really neat because we've seen them grow up. And sometimes on, earlier on Sunday mornings, you can get onto uh, Facebook and you can see them live stream their church services. And Fredo, one of our favorites, is you can get on there and watch him preach or lead singing. And it's really an amazing feeling. So they're doing some really awesome uh, work there. And Tanya's going to tell us about it. It's all yours, Tanya. All right. Thank you, Brian. I wish I could kind of see you all, but um, we, we really can't see you. So we'll just um, take for granted that you all are there. But thank you so much for letting um, Jillian and I come and speak tonight. Um, and <clears throat> um, I want to just take a minute and introduce Jillian. So Jillian is... Hey, before we do that, Brian, do we have the capability? Can I screen share so we can put our PowerPoint up? Yes, absolutely. You can just uh, share the screen. Okay, perfect. Um, uh, yeah, I just want to introduce Jillian, and Brian gave a nice introduction to, to me, but in... Um, uh, Jillian is our executive director of Emmaus House. She and I co-founded um, Emmaus House together in 2013, and uh, we are we're partners in it. We've been um, kind of really moving this forward together for the last um, seven years. So I guess eight years now. So I asked her to come on as well, and um, we just want to. We have a, a presentation we'd like to present to you, and just kind of just let you know about the work that we're doing. And Tracy and Brian have been such a critical part of sharing the word, of um, letting people know the work that we're doing because it's it's kind of an, it's an aspect that gets lost and kind of missed sometimes. So um, an aspect of orphan care and of a work in the church basically that I think gets lost sometimes. So. I'm going to have Jillian go ahead and share her screen, and we're going to tell you a little bit about Emmaus House and, and the work that um, Tracy and Brian no, have. Look at this you know, this look one right here is cool. Hold up. With him without the mask. Jillian, we this can't part. hear you. We can hear somebody else, though. No, look. <laughs> Not sure what's happening. Sorry about that. So Jillian has four kids. I have six kids. So, you know, and we're in the middle of a pandemic. So we're all at home. Um, we, we're doing our church services at home. Here comes Jillian. As well, so. <laughs> Can you hear me? Now? Yeah. Yes. My kids' devices were taking over my audio. Um, okay, so I still can't screen share. It says host has disabled attendee screen sharing. So while we're waiting on that, um, I just want to kind of talk about how Emmaus House started. And um, so in 2013, well, in 2010, I took my first trip to Haiti. And that same year, Jillian came to work full time in Haiti. And on that trip, my husband and I um, adopted two kids from, um, from the orphanage that we had gone to visit. And um, so we brought them home in 2013. It took two and a half years for us to complete our adoption. And at that time in 2013, um, the orphanage that Jillian had now been working with for three years had um, needed to keep their licensing. They had to um, have all the kids who were aging out over the age of 18, they all had to leave the orphanage. So the average age that somebody in, in Haiti finishes high school is 24. So at the age of 18, they were nowhere near even completing high school. Um, unemployment rate of 40%. There's really no way that anybody at the age of 18 
um, who has no family support system would be able to make their way. And so we'll talk a little bit about why that propelled us so much to start Emmaus House and start this work. So can you share your screen? Oh, great. Starting to work, yes. Perfect. There it is. All right, awesome. Let me get this. Yeah. All right. All right, so um, the mission of Emmaus House is super simple. We transition orphaned youth into independent living in Haiti. And that sounds so simple, but it's so very complex. And something I want to point out is in America, the, the foster care system, 20% <clears throat> of the kids who age out of the foster care system are homeless on their 18th birthday. And so, um, and that's in America where you can go down to McDonald's and you can get a job and you can, you know, you can kind of pull yourself up, if you will. There, there's an infrastructure in place. And in Haiti, there's just, there's really no governmental infrastructure in place. There's very little school infrastructure, um, employment infrastructure. It, it's very weak and it's lacking. And so it's, it's difficult to just kind of, without any kind of support system, come up and try to um, really do something with all of this. Um, so Jillian, did you want to take the slide or did you want me to? You're good. You're good. I'll take the next one. Okay. All right. So, um, something that Jillian and I have both seen and I, I saw in those three years, uh, working in Haiti, uh, before we started Emmaus House and then she started, she started to see is these just very difficult facts for what actually happens to kids who age out. And I could tell you facts for what happens to kids, kids who age out of the foster care system here in America, but this is what happens to kids who age out of orphanages. And this is worldwide. This isn't just in Haiti. This is just what happens. And Jillian and I can put faces to these statistics. We, we know kids that have ended up in, in these exact circumstances, and which is why we decided to start Emmaus House, because we couldn't have these 17 kids that were aging out of the orphanage go back into these situations or go into these situations and this be their adult life. So um, 300,000 um, grow up in domestic slavery and they age out at 18 and they are 40 times more likely to become criminals. And they are 10 times more likely to enter prostitution. They're 500 times more likely to commit suicide. Those are devastating statistics. Um, in Haiti, there's a system called the Restavec system. And what that means in Creole is it means to stay with. And it's sort of their, um, Haiti's form of foster care, if you will. But really what it means is if I can't take care of my child or I don't have the, the money, I live in poverty, what happens is um, uh, somebody from the city says, well, I'll take care of them and I'll send them to school, but they just have to do work for me. So it's basically a form of domestic slavery. Um, and it's, it's condoned throughout the country. Well, when these kids grow up and they age out, um, the girls specifically are at, at very, very high risk. And um, it's not really appropriate anymore to have a foster care, foster child in your care, if you will, um, when they hit 18, 16, 17, 18. And so um, the fate for these kids is, is pretty, um, pretty dramatic. It's pretty bad. So, um, before the age of 18, 26% of girls and 21% of boys have experienced sexual violence. And 61% of girls and 57% of boys have experienced physical violence. Haiti, rape wasn't even a crime in Haiti until, what was it, Jillian, 2000? Maybe. Yeah. Do you remember the year? It was like, it's in the 2000s until recently, recent decades. And so... There, there's so much abuse happening. And, and with these statistics, it's difficult to even get great statistics in Haiti again because of the lack of infrastructure. So, um, and then by the age of 25, the average Haitian has only completed five years of schooling. There is no government school system per se. And so any of these kids are going to have to um, pay for their own school. And then um, with the extreme poverty rate, it's really difficult to afford school. So kids who are orphaned without families are extremely vulnerable. And then this last statistic, um, the reason we bring this up is we're gonna talk about the importance of education 
um, less than 1% of the population in Haiti attends college. That's um, pretty remarkable when, when you really just think about, okay, how many of you in the audience have attended college at one point or another? Just take a, and that's just attended college. It's not even graduating college. So just, th just kind of get some perspective on that for a minute. Right, we can go to the next one. Yeah, so Tanya mentioned a little bit about our story there in the beginning while we were waiting for our PowerPoint to come up. Um, but as she had mentioned too with those statistics is we, when we see those numbers, we put the pictures of these youth that we love to them. We, those, statistic, those statistics for us have names and faces. Um, and as my husband and I were living in Haiti those first few years, we were living and working at an orphanage and we were seeing these play out in the lives of our kids constantly. We um, have been in the jail visiting one of our boys when he left the orphanage, got in a gang and was arrested. Um, we've been to funerals of some of our kids. Um, we have uh, known multiple girls who have left the orphanage system and had to use prostitution as a way to feed themselves and to find a place to sleep that night. Um, and I have sat by the bed in a hospital of one of our girls after she has attempted um, suicide. And so after we had seen this enough, we finally said, we have to do more. We have to step in and help these kids, not just when they're cute and cuddly, um, but when they're older and going through this really vital point in their life um, as young adults. And so uh, with Tanya and with our friend Jerome in Haiti, we started Emmaus House. And as we were trying to come up with what we were going to call this place, um, we had lots of different ideas. But I had, I had talked to some of our girls who were going to be moving to Emmaus House with us. And I, I was asking them for ideas and they were throwing out all sorts of suggestions, but almost everyone that they brought to me had the word hope in it. And quickly Tanya and I realized, this is what our kids are looking for the most, is they need hope that there is a better future for them, that there is family for them, that there is something for them past this life at this institution. And thinking of that brought me back to the story in Luke 24, when these two men are traveling on the road to Emmaus, Jesus had just died, all their hope has been lost, and they don't know what is next for them, but they're journeying home and Jesus meets them on the way. And he journeys with them all the way home and in the comfort of their house, their eyes are opened and their hope is restored. And this is exactly what we wanted for these youth. We wanted to journey alongside them. We wanted to take them to a home where they would be loved and safe. And we wanted them to know the hope that they can have in Jesus. Um, and Tanya shared our mission statement earlier, that is to transition orphan youth into independent living. And she also mentioned that sounds so simple, but really it is so complicated. There are so many things that we do at Emmaus House to help our youth um, fulfill this mission in their own life. And, but our four core ways that we do this um, are right here. One, having our family homes. This is so important for our kids. We have two homes right now, one for our boys and one for our girls. And they're both led by Haitian house parents. And it is structured just like your average home in Haiti would be. Um, and so most of our kids who have come to us, well, they're all orphaned um, coming to May's house, but many of them have had very little, if no experience being inside of a Christian home before. And so we believe this is where so many life lessons are learned. And so this is where we base everything that we do is inside of these homes. Discipleship is huge to us. We know that you can have hope of education, hope for food on the table, hope for family even, but if you don't have hope in your relationship with God um, and what he can do in your life, then, then it's all meaningless. And so we really want to um, teach every person who comes into Emmaus house about, about God and his word. And education, all of our youth do go to some form of school, whether that is um, secondary school, professional school, or university and then emotional health. So all of the youth who come to us have experienced some level of trauma. And uh, we have two professional counselors on staff that work with them every week. 
um, to help them really process the things that they've been through and help them make steps towards um, a healthier future. So this idea of discipling future leaders in the bottom middle there is, um, is Jonathan. And Jonathan is our spiritual director. And he, we just, we just knew as we were growing our program, there has to be somebody that's just devoted to making sure that our youth are led spiritually. And so that's his full-time job is just all of the, um, all of the 20 youth that are in our program. He is, his job is, is to lead them spiritually. And I've told our kids numerous times that, you know, we can get you the best job in the world. We, you know, you can have the best education in the world, but at the end of it all, if you don't have Jesus, then I haven't done my job. The program hasn't done its job. And so um, all of our kids that have come from the outside um, that haven't come from an orphan, from the orphanage, um, all of them, John, uh, Jonathan does a uh, an introductory Bible study with them, and all of them have been baptized um, and decided to become Christians. And on the right there bottom, you'll see um, Anzi, and Anzi became a Christian. He grew up in the orphanage, and he became a Christian, oh, what was it, a year and a half ago? It, it's pretty recently, but he's been at Emmaus House the whole time. He, he graduated from the program. He got a job. He was successful. He was, he's one of our our greatest success stories, but he still hadn't obeyed the gospel. And so um, last year he came to a point in his life and he went to Jonathan and he um, decided to obey the gospel. And that's Moise there baptizing him. And he um, is the, the preacher in the church where, where the kids um, all worship. So it's been just watching our youth on their spiritual journey has been really inspiring. And so since 2013, we've served 40 youth in, in Haiti. And that doesn't sound like a very big number in eight years to only have 40 youth. Maybe it, maybe it does sound big to some of you, maybe it doesn't. But what we put into those youth, we spend so much time with them. We put so much energy into them. We put so many resources to, into them so that they have what they need to become successfully independent. Those of you who... Um, have kids who've left your home and who have made that transition to independence. I now have three who've done that and none of them, and we talk about this all the time, none of them have been this just wonderful, just calm. Uh, it, it's rocky and it's messy. And, and my kids have a really, they have a perfect family if I just want to say so myself. <laughs> but no, they re really, uh, my kids have a good support system. And it's been rocky and it's been hard and it's been a struggle. And so um, of the kids of the 40 youth that we've, we've served um, from the beginning, 79% uh, have become Christians um, of those who weren't um, previously um, baptized. 33% um, have attended a university. Do you, if you recall earlier, only 1% of the population in Haiti has the opportunity to attend university. And so one third of those youth have, have attended university and a lot of them are about ready to graduate and it's, it's really exciting. 23% um, have attended grade trade school, 20% have become unemployed, have become employed. And then 8% have been reuni reunited with family. And I wanna just touch on this for a minute um, that there are times when we can find family, um, biological family that, that can take care of our youth, that can kind of help them and support them in that transition. And so again, that's part of that messy, that's part of with each of our youth, we look at their cases and we evaluate their life and we look at, okay, what are the resources that you have to make your life work um, already there? And so we take advantage of those resources. And so sometimes that means you know what, you're going to go live with your mom or you're going to go live with um, a, another family member who, who can take care of you, but isn't completely capable of helping you successfully transition. And so, um, so again, for each, and, and I look at each one of these girls on this picture and each one of them have a completely different story, a completely different feature. 
and um, completely different needs. They all just have very different needs. So uh, we work really hard to assess those needs and meet them. Next one, Jen. Yeah, and this, um, just a little bit about our staff. So uh, as we mentioned before, my husband and I had lived in Haiti from 2011 to 2017. And when we started Emmaus House in 2013, we had this, what many people thought was a crazy idea, um, but this idea that we wanted to be fully Haitian led on the ground. We wanted our Haitian staff to take ownership of this ministry and lead it um, there in Haiti. And for us to be kind of a, um, a support on the backside. And so we spent those four years that we were there with Emmaus House, really forming the program and training our staff up to be ready um, to lead it there in Haiti. And so we were very intentional when we moved. We thought it was the right time and it really was. And it's been hard. Um, especially in that first year, it was really hard. But every time we go back to Haiti, we are reminded um, why we made that decision. Our staff have never been stronger. Our program has never been stronger. The relationship that our youth have with our staff now um, is so much better that they are since since we're not there. And, and maybe that sounds bad on me and my husband, um, but there's just some level of understanding that they can have with our youth that me as an outsider and even Tanya as an outsider, we can never have. And so having that bond with people from their own community, their own culture, their own language really has made such a difference. Um, so we employ 13 Haitian professionals um, right now all of who are amazing. And so this is just a glimpse of our, our full-time staff and then um, we have our part-time staff as well. So we've kind of come to this place. We've been going for eight years. <clears throat> and a few years ago, our staff came to us and said, um, we're renting houses. Do we want to, do we want to keep a Mayus house sustainable? Do we want to, they didn't use the word sustainable, but do, what do we want to do? Do we want to just kind of age these kids out and then stop? Or do we want to, um, do we want to start, continue to serve Haiti for years to come? And so we all had to really sit down and decide. And we just said, well, what do you guys want to do? What do you all want to do? And they said, Haiti needs this. Haiti needs places that are going to help these kids make this transition successfully. There's no other programs that are doing this. There's no other families that are doing this and meeting the needs of these kids in this way. And so, um, so we decided to um, purchase land and we decided we were going to build. We took a huge leap of faith and that was, goodness, what year was that, Julian? 2017? 2018? 2018 when we broke ground and built the wall and started building the wall and everything. Well, 2019, we built the wall. So, um, but we decided with, with, this, with this land, with this, um, with our own building, we would be able to give a higher quality of care because the quality of care that we're giving now is good, but we can give a higher quality of care if we, if we could kind of have our own campus. So speaking towards that, we could probably come up with the list a mile long. I and mean, Tanya and I have started this list. And even today we were, oh, we need to add that to the list of all the things that we're going to be able to do on this new campus, all the different things that we're going to be able to provide our youth and staff that we just can't now because of our location. Um, but these are definitely our top six, the things that continue to come up um, that are, are such necessities for us. That first one is is key security for at-risk youth. So, um, you know, we've mentioned a few times, a lot of these kids come to us with pretty significant traumas and especially for girls who have come to us, we've had a few who have um, had pretty abusive relationships prior to coming to us. And, and while we may be safe inside of our walls, um, the fact is that they have to walk through a pretty busy and crowded neighborhood every single day um, 
just, I was there in December and my husband is a photographer and he, this, this girl, Gael, um, in that first picture there, um, he was taking pictures of her walking in the streets and uh, some of our girls had joined her. And even she was halfway down the street right before he took this shot. And there was a group of boys, teenage boys over in the corner, whistling at her, hackling her, trying to get her attention. And she deals with that every day in this community and all of our girls do. Um, and how dangerous that is for some of our girls that come to May's house. We've even had kids who have come to us before that, um, as much as we wanted to take them in, as much as they needed us, we were not a secure enough facility for them to come to us. We had to say no to them. And we don't know what has happened to these girls um, since then, um, if they were able to find a safe place to go. And so at our new property, we will be in a very secluded environment. We will be outside of the community. These girls and boys will not have to walk through um, this kind of um, situation every day, we will be transporting them in vehicles and it will be much more secure um, for these kids to come to us. Another one is confidential meeting spaces. So we have 13 staff that I, I had mentioned before and their office space, the only office space we have is one little room um, that is in our boys' house and it's the size of my bathroom. <laughs> and my bathroom is not that big. I live in a very modest house and all 13 of our staff cram into this little office space. I don't even know how they do it um, once a week for their meetings. And here this is this is where they're discussing personal issues with each other, um, issues with the youth, things that have to remain confidential. And yet it can't. They don't even have an appropriate space where they can meet um, when our counselors do one-on-one -on -one with our kids, they have to go to the roof of the house if there is good enough weather, because there is no space for them to meet with our youth and talk in a confidential, a confidential space. Um, but at our new property, we will have offices and we will have meeting areas where all of these things can happen. And then a closer proximity to church. There is a Church of Christ in our community that our youth walk to. Um, in this picture, they're walking outside of that church building. Um, but at our new property, we are just like right across the street um, from a local um, uh, Bibles college and um, Church of Christ that we are really excited to get plugged in with and be a part of the ministry that they having that they are are doing. As well. And that was one of the things that Jerome, Jerome is our Haitian administrator. He's pictured there in the middle in the white shirt on, on the top. And that was one of the things that he loved about that piece of land in particular was that this church, I went to go visit it with him and I was like, there's not a lot of youth here. There's not a lot of, and he said, yeah, think what, it's, think about the impact that Emmaus House could have on this church. What, think about what we could do, how we could give back, how our youth could learn to give back. And the energy that we could bring into this church. So I just sold. <laughs> I was sold. So that was that was the land that we ended up buying because our youth can just walk right back and forth. And it, it's pretty amazing. So another really and something else that will lead to a higher quality of care is privacy for house parents. And that might not sound on the surface to be very um, necessary. But I worked with Mountain States Children's Home. Some of you might be um, uh, might know about them, but I don't know, 25, 30 years ago, I worked for them and Randy Scow was still the executive director and he and I still talk today and he advises me all the time on this work. But anyway, um, one thing when I first started working there, the average, the average lifespan of a house parent was two years because it's really stressful work when you are dealing with these kids who've suffered the severe trauma. You're dealing with, with, uh, really high stress level. So this idea of having privacy for our house parents, our house parents in the houses that they have now, they don't have kind of the sectioned off place in the 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 house the house plans that we've set up. Uh, the fa their family will have kind of their own place, and so making sure that our staff is taken care of and that our house parents, the longevity of our house parents, um, is sustainable is really important to us. So that's a piece that will help us provide a higher quality of care if we're able to, um, to build these buildings and, and build these homes. Um, multiple learning spaces. I've trained numerous times in Haiti. I have a 
uh, I train our organization and then I train other organizations on trauma-informed care. And that's the little living room in the boys' house. That's the biggest space that we have at a man's house right now. And um, so we have to rent other places. We have to go to other organizations and that costs money. And, and then we have to charge people and we have to charge organizations. So that's something else we'd really love to use the space for is we can train our staff, we can train other organizations, we can, we can um, the community, we can have trainings with the community and just all sorts of ideas with that. But, um, but that's a big one. It, we're limited in our ability to train even all of our staff a lot of times. And then community and outreach services. Um, Jerome has just started this basketball. Uh, he started a running club and then he's also started a basketball a program where he's had community members and other kids from the community that are around our kids' age come in and they just play basketball. You can see the, the amount of enthusiasm that's there. I think, Jillian, you were there that day, weren't you? Yes, we, did. we had a tournament and we won. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do have one of the best players in Haiti as part of a man's house, one of the best ba basketball players of ha in Haiti, Max, which um, Tracy knows Max. Um, he, he's part of a man's house. So that might be part of why there's some excitement around it. But, but yeah, the whole point is we're looking to have this higher quality of care um, if we can kind of have the space to, to really provide what our kids need. And then we'd also be able to provide for an additional 10 youth. Um, and that's just on campus. That's not um, outside at universities and, and all of that. So, all right. We probably need to get moving. Um, so this is just a layout of our campus. Um, this is on our website. Um, if y'all want to head over there and you can see more about it there. Um, and just uh, going over numbers, the fun stuff, right? Um, our, we started raising funds for this back in, I think we our first fundraiser, the first time we ever attempted to raise money for our building project was in October of 2016. Um, and since then we have raised 36% of our overall funds. Um, it's definitely been slower than what we've wanted. Last year, we really kind of had to put all this on pause because of COVID. We just weren't able to do what we needed to do and had to focus our efforts elsewhere. Um, but since then, we've been able to purchase the property, drill this, uh, um, build the security wall around the whole property and drill our well, which we just did. And we are hoping um, early this summer to break ground um, to build our first house. And then as far as just our general operations of what we need to continue our programming as is in Haiti, um, this is where we are for 2021. Um, in that you can kind of just see just our general operations and our sponsorship about a third of our operations is covered through our sponsorship program. So we try to find sponsors for all the youth who live um, at Emmaus House and who are in our university program. Um, and that covers their education, their rent, their food and water, medical expenses, um, and they all can earn a weekly allowance and it provides for that as well. Um, we are looking for new youth sponsors. We have five kids right now who still need sponsorship support. So if anybody is interested in that, I, I would, um, if you go to our website, um, there's a sponsorship tab at the top and you can see the kids, get to meet them, who they are, who needs support and fill out an application online. We would love to have you sponsor. Sorry, I jumped ahead on that one there, Tanya. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, let's see. What, Brian, how much time do we have? Did we want to end at a quarter till? Uh, we have about, yeah, quarter till, about okay. seven minutes. Okay, I just want to make sure I don't go over. Um, on, the, on the land layout, um, we've got a boy's house, a girl's house in the back. And then in the front, there's a house that you'll see that um, is a little... Um, it's got another additional fence around it. Yeah, I just wanted to touch on this. And that's what we're calling the refuge house. And that's going to be a therapeutic intensive program for girls who've been trafficked, for girls who come to us who've been um, severely traumatized by abuse. So I wanted to just point that out kind of before we go into this, this last um, section that we're, and then those girls will transition 
to our regular Emmaus House program and then transition to independence from there. But we're just working on part of this higher level of care is this more um, deeply therapeutic piece of um, really helping youth deal with their trauma, come, into, come to really understand who God is and how he can meet their needs. Okay, thanks, Joanne. Um, but just some ways that you can help. I, I wish we were there in person so I could shake your hands and meet you and all of that. Um, but clearly that's not possible. I only live at, I only live like eight hours away. So I'm happy to come visit in person. But um, prayer, I think our youth, when Jillian talks about our sponsorship program, I think Fredo, one of the biggest, knowing that that Tracy and Brian are continually praying for him and that he has somebody in his court, somebody who is, who is um, just on his side, that goes a long way to build rapport with our kids and to build confidence and hope in our kids. So just praying for us in praying for our youth is, is so critical. Jillian described about um, being a youth sponsor um, and how impactful that is. Talk to Brian and, and Tracy about that. They've, they've, um, they've just been incredible. They've had a huge impact on our program and on our, and on our youth. Um, and then providing a better future, this, this higher level of care. If um, this, this is our youth on our land right here and you can see the wall behind them and, and there's still a lot of work to be done. So um, those are all ways that Emmaus House is in need right now that we, um, we, we can really um, use partnership with and, and, and use help. So um, I, I'm going to jump in. Um, Tracy had the opportunity two years ago to go down and spend some time in Haiti with Tanya. And it was uh, the stories that she came back with were, were just amazing. Um, if you if anyone wants to hear them, uh, Tracy's got them. Tracy's got the pictures and she can tell you uh, all of her experiences that she had uh, with Tanya um, in Haiti. I don't think. Jillian, you were there on that trip. Um, what I will do is uh, on our Inside Facebook uh, page, I'll go ahead and repost this recording. I will also give a link to um, the Emmaus House Facebook page and their website. And Tanya or, or Jillian, if you have any additional information that you would like to post along with that to make available to our members, uh, just send it my way. And I'll make sure that we uh, we get it out uh, to our members here. So with that, uh, we really appreciate uh, your time tonight and um, uh, Tanya and Jillian uh, telling us a little bit about your work. And I think it's fantastic work. And so it's meant a lot to uh, Tracy and myself and um, being participating in it. Uh, so it's been you know, a part of our life as well. Tanya, any uh, last words before we do some of our songs? We're open to any questions. Um, just, you know, you can use any of this information to give us any questions or anything like that. But um, yeah, thank you all so much for giving us time tonight. It really means a lot. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs>